God has something for us this morning in his word. And more than anything, we want to just open up our hearts to receive all that he has for us. And, you know, I believe it was Pastor John who was praying, or it might have been Paco when he was leading. He said, Lord, have your way. Have your way. And that's what we want to pray this morning. We want God to have his complete way in service this morning. Okay? Let's pray together. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we humble and bow our hearts before you, realizing and recognizing that you are God, you are the creator, you are the king, and you are Lord. And we acknowledge that your presence is here to meet with us and to manifest yourself to us, Father. And God, we just thank you that because of your omniscience you know everything about us you know where we are what season of life we're in and you know what we need to hear most from you so father we ask corporately that you would speak to us and that you would minister what we need from your word in jesus name amen to go ahead and have your seats please welcome to church all of you who are Viewing via live stream, welcome all of our first time guests, welcome to church. We're so grateful that you are here this morning. We are completing a study that we have been on in the book of 1 Peter, and I'll be um, speaking out of 1 Peter chapter 5, so if you don't mind going there and just being prepared in your Bible or your electronic device, 1 Peter chapter 5. And in this fifth chapter, Again, Peter is continuing to encourage the churches in the five Roman provinces who are going through some very challenging and difficult times. And he himself has is, is been suffering as well, but he's trying to encourage them. And I, I noticed some things as I looked in this fifth chapter that Peter is not only writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but Peter is also speaking out of his own life experience and things that have been said to him, things that he learned from Jesus himself and that he was just a part of when Jesus was teaching. And so we're going to learn some of these wonderful, wonderful lessons and themes that are going to be imperative for each one of us as a Christ follower, as a Christian, but these things are especially important if you are going through a challenging time, a difficult time, if you are experiencing persecution, because of your faith and your trust in God. The very first lesson we're gonna to learn today from Peter is that we need to care and be cared for. Say it with me, to care and be cared for. Let's begin reading in 1 Peter chapter one, I'm sorry, chapter five, verses one through four. It says, the elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also, also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Now, Peter here is addressing a specific group. He's talking to the elders, also known in this passage as the overseers, or we would know as pastors or spiritual leaders. And as much as all the other Christians in, this pro in these provinces were coming under persecution because they were being falsely accused and slandered, having been accused of starting fires that they did not begin, they, they're under this persecution, but these elders, these leaders are also under persecution as well. And as much as these believers were going through hard times, so were the spiritual leaders as well. When you are a leader in any capacity, then what happens is the target on your back gets a little bit bigger. And so Peter didn't want to neglect mentioning these elders and these overseers because when you're going through a hard time, no matter who you are, there is a tendency to want to pull back and pull away from your responsibilities and what your calling is to. 
Now, all of us are, not all of us in here, but some of us in here are parents. We're called to be parents, and we have a, a responsibility to our children, to our families. Some of us are in here are, are managers and supervisors, and some of us in here are business owners or, or uh, professors, coaches. You may be a provost of a university. There are certain things based on your position that you have responsibilities toward. But when all of us who are going through a difficult time, sometimes those difficulties weigh on us, create a pressure upon us, and sometimes we might not want to continue to step up to the plate and do what it is that we already know we're supposed to do. Can someone uh, communicate with me this morning? And, and Peter here is realizing that, and so he's saying to the elders, you guys, there are some things I want you to remember to do. It's important for you to care for God's people. Care for God's people. I know that you as a leader are going through a lot, but here's the deal. You've got to care for the people. He says, shepherd the flock of God. The word shepherd there means to care, means to tend, means to um, protect, lead, guide. It means to nourish, to feed them. And this is so important that we care. Now, you may say, I'm not a pastor, but you're a mom. You're a dad. You're an uncle. You're somebody's grandfather. You, you hold a, a, a role of significance in the lives of other people. And the reason that, you know, Peter says these things to these leaders and to us today in whatever capacity we might serve in or stand in is because people have been entrusted to us. And therefore, because God is trusting people to us, God wants us to care for those individuals, and we can work that out through various ways. But I want to just talk to you about one particular way, but let me just tell you this particular uh, experience I recently had. I was at a, um, a luncheon for a local police agency here in our area, and uh, I was there sitting next to a, a woman, and she was dressed in uniform, but she was not a police officer herself. She was a volunteer with the police department. And as we began to converse, she shared with me how she began to volunteer because her son had been killed tragically in a car accident a year before. And she felt like this is something that she needed to do. And she shared with me some of the things that she was doing. And although she was going through a horrific time of grief herself, she realized that she needed to help and care for others in her community. When Peter said shepherd the flock of God, one of the key words in that from the original language is feed, feed. See, feeding is very important to God because God is our father, and in the Greek language, the word father is pater, it means nourisher. So God wants his kids to be fed and be taken care of. All of us would, would have a, a, a weird look on our face if we continually saw children who were not nourished and fed at home, although they already had parents in a place where they could reside in. We would just think something's wrong with that. Well, God wants his children to be taken care of spiritually, to be fed and to be nourished. And when we take care of people, understand people need to be nourished in their soul. They may need some money, they might need a car, they might need a job, but more importantly, and most importantly, people need nourishment in their soul. This is why God said, I believe in Jeremiah 3.15, and I will give you shepherds according to my heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. This whole concept of feeding is very important to God in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament, but let me read another Old Testament verse, Ezekiel 34, 2 through 3. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flocks. The Bible says to all of us, the lips of the righteous feed many. Because God has made us in right relationship with himself through his son, Jesus Christ, you'd be surprised how many hungry, famished souls there are around us who just need a kind word. 
need an encouraging word, could use a verse of scripture or something to read, even by way of text, to lift up their heart and recalibrate their thinking and their thoughts in their mind. People need to be cared for. Then he mentioned that these elders are also overseers, which means to give attention to and to look after. People need to know that somebody is looking after them. I thought I was going to get more amens than that, but that's okay. People need to know that somebody's looking after them. And when you are, the scripture said, serve as an overseer. Don't just be an overseer and just stare at folk. No, serve as an overseer. See, a shepherd is two things. A shepherd walks among the sheep, thus he smells like them, but a shepherd oversees the sheep and looks over and makes sure everything is good. See, in real life, a shepherd, a shepherd, He's, he's, he's thinking of his sheep all the time. He knows all of his sheep by name. He, he has a specific name for all of his sheep. I'm one of God's sheep just like you are. God has nicknames for me. One of them is Dark Knight. Um, the other one is, uh, he has a few different names for me, you know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Anyway, anyway, when a shepherd cannot find one of his sheep, a couple of thoughts goes in his head. Number one, he's gotten away. And maybe he's been killed by a wolf or a lion or something like that. The other one is that this sheep is on his back. This is called a cast sheep. When a sheep is turned over and he can't can't roll himself over to get up, he stays like this and he bleats. (laughs) And he just bleats until he gets help. But if he doesn't get help, he's going to die. And when we're looking after people, we must be reminded that some people have fallen. They're on their back. They're at their wits end. They've been going through things physically, emotionally, mentally, financially, and in their families and relationships and on their job, and they need someone to come and lift them up. But if we don't serve as someone who's looking after them, who's there to care for them, we'll just look at them and leave them there. So God is saying, no, 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 even though you're going through some stuff, I want you to be able to care for the people, care for others. But then not only care, but be cared for. Sometimes we can be so strong within ourselves that we won't allow others to care for us when we need care. Every person needs care. Isn't it interesting in the fourth verse, he says, the chief shepherd shall appear. Well, the chief shepherd, of course, is referring to Jesus Christ. But in the ancient times, there was a chief shepherd, and the chief shepherd oversaw other shepherds. So as the shepherds would keep the sheep and take care of them, the chief shepherd would take care of the other shepherds. And God wants all of us to be cared for. See, Peter knew this firsthand. Peter had left the ministry. And Jesus, the chief shepherd, came and cared for him. He didn't condemn him. He just said, hey, Peter, you want some breakfast? You caught any fish out there? Throw your net on the other side of the boat. You'll you'll, you'll do fine. He started to care for him and bring him back to the calling that God had for his life. So he knew what he was talking about when he said this. He knew the importance of care. And when Jesus cared for him, Jesus said, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to go care for others. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. See, that's why the two go together hand in hand. We have to care and be cared for. And see, care is available. Notice the term flock of God in the verses that we read. It doesn't just say a sheep of God. Shepherd, a sheep of God. No, Shepherd, the flock of God. See, a flock is a, 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 a gathering of a sheep. It's part of a herd. Look around at this flock. Look around. Look around. Turn your head. Look around. Look around. You guys aren't looking around. Look around. <laughs> you know what you see? You see the flock of God. And as much as leaders and elders and overseers and pastors can care for you, God wants you to be cared for by one another. 
That's one of the dynamics and the beauty of the body of Christ is we are a body and we can care for each other. You know, if, if, you're, if you get a pain in your back, guess what happens? Another part of the body comes and be, begins to minister to that pain. You begin to massage yourself. If you fall, another part of the body wipes that knee off. We're supposed to care one for another. I heard this song called Take Me Back by Cochran and Company. It says, take me back to the place that feels like home, to the people I can depend on to the faith that's in my bones. Take me back to a preacher and a verse where they seen me at my worst, to the love I had at first. Oh, I want to go to church. Take me back to the place that feels like home, to the people I can depend on, to the faith that's in my bones. Take me back to a preacher and a verse where they seen me at my worst, to the love I had at first. Oh, I want to go to church. I want to go to church. Oh, more than an obligation, it's our foundation. The family of God, I know it's hard, but we need each other. We're sisters and brothers. Oh, take me back to the place that feels like home, to the people I can depend on. Take me back to church. We need to care for one another. And that is probably most realized, not just in a corporate setting, but in smaller communities, men's, women's, young adults, work life, small groups, celebrate recovery, uh, support groups. We need to be around other people so we can be cared for by others. The second thing we learn from Peter is that we need to be clothed with humility. Clothed with humility. Say it with me. Clothed with humility. 1 Peter 5, verse 5 through 7 says this. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. These are some of my life verses right here, and I love them, and they've helped me so much and continue to help me. But Peter is wanting to help the church at large, the church who's going through a lot of suffering, the church who's going through a hard time. And just as he addressed a specific group of elders, now he's turning to younger people. Now, who's he talking about when he says younger people? Those who are in the youth group, those who are in young adults, those who are in children's church? Is, or is he talking about everybody who's not an elder? You younger people, because he addressed the elders first, spiritual leaders, then he says you younger people. So could he be talking about the entire congregation? Or if we define the word younger, we begin to discover that it means new. It means regenerate. It means just come into existence. So I would like to suggest that perhaps Peter is talking to those who've come new to the faith. They're just in the body of Christ. They're just in the family of God. And his word to them is submit. Why? Because he, he wants them to, to be taken uh, control of? No. Because submit, the first thing about submit we need to understand is this word order. Order. The word submit is a military term. It means to order under. Order under. In the military, a corporal is under a sergeant. A staff sergeant is under a master sergeant. In every form of God's order of things, there is order, and that's how we know it's from God. And part of their learning and growth is to understand, put yourself under God's ordained authority. They're not there to lord it over you. They're there to protect you and cover you. When you're younger spiritually, Sometimes what happens is you just take everything in. Everything somebody says, sometimes you're so hungry and thirsty for truth and just to know and, and to grow in God, you take in everything and there's, there's a need for protection. Does everybody understand what I'm saying today? Children have a tendency to put everything in their mouths. They just think it's okay. They can put a, a bug in their mouth. They can put a marble in their mouth. 
And, and you need people to help you, to guide you, to lead you, to oversee you. And it's just because of lack of knowledge. Sometimes there's just being naive. You just don't, you just don't know. You just think everything is all good. And they needed spiritual leaders for this purpose. And sometimes on the natural side of things, when you're younger, sometimes you just tend to know, you tend to think you know everything. We've all been there. You just think you know everything. You think you're smarter than your parents. You think you're smarter than everybody who's older than you. You just think you're cooler than them and you're smarter than them too. And they're out of touch and they're out of time and they don't know. But they've already walked around the block you're walking around. And I think that exists. It's funny, Mark Twain said, when I was, you know, 14 years old, my father was so ignorant I could hardly be around the old man. And when I turned 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned. <laughs> Peter said, be clothed with humility. I have some friends who are going to come up and join me on the stage right now. Let's give them a hand as they come. Oh. Oh. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, right here. Stand right here. Okay, these two ladies, Scott, I'm going to use you in another okay. example. Okay. <laughs> willing, willing. That's a servant right there. These two, yeah, let's give it up to Scott. These two ladies represent younger in Christ, more mature in Christ. Okay? I'm going to let you be the younger one today. Okay. <laughs> Okay, and so they represent this. Now, they both have on, they're both clothed with an apron. When, when he said be clothed with humility, that is what he was talking about. Put on the apron of what? A servant. Now, the younger could say, I don't need to wear an apron of a servant. You're more mature than me. You serve me. Or the more mature in Christ could say, I'm more mature than you. Therefore, you're younger, you serve me. God says, no, I'm about to give you the answer to generational gaps, generational differences, and all that stuff. Both of you guys put on an apron and serve each other. That's how it's supposed to work in the kingdom. No one is greater than the other. Both are supposed to serve, and both have a designed, divine purpose in order to do so. If we clothe ourselves with this mindset then we'll have unity. If we have unity, then God will command a blessing. And when you say, I want to see more miracles, my question to you is, are you clothed with an apron? Because it starts with humility, my friend. It does not start with pride. Thank you very much, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you. When we're proud, we try to become more than what we're ready for at any given moment. When we're proud, we think we deserve something. When we're proud, we think we should be in a certain place. And it's when you're younger spiritually, sometimes the enemy knows you're young. And he knows you don't know a lot. So he tries to give you thoughts that, cre that create this idea that I know more and you don't know as much as you think you know yet because you haven't walked it out. Information comes, but then we begin to walk in it after meditation and then revelation, and then we see manifestation. And it just takes time. I remember Pastor Baylor saying, it takes time for God to make a disciple and a leader. It doesn't happen overnight. And when we are proud, it just takes even longer. But here's, here's what happens. The Bible says that the proud God resists. See, when you're already in a season of suffering and there are people who are resisting you because of your faith in him, you don't want him to be resisting you too. You need his help. Why would you want him to resist you? But if we think that we don't need him and we got this, I got this. I got, I'm good. I got this. I know what to do. I got my degrees. I know I'm straight. I know what to do, Lord. I'm good. No, friend, we don't got this. 
We don't. Everybody say, I don't got this. <laughs> He's got it. But the, the, the scripture says, the proud he knows from afar off. Way over there. We're over here. God's way over there because of pride. And that's why it says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. You know what happens when we humble ourselves under God's mighty hand? When we, when we begin to put our dependence on him and not on ourselves. When we do that, the Bible says he will exalt us. And friend, it's better when God exalts you than when we try to exalt ourselves. If we pull ourselves up, then we've got to hold ourselves up. If we let God lift us up, then God holds us up. And the scripture says that he gives more grace to the humble. See, when you're going through challenges, you know what you, know what you need more of? You need more grace. Grace. His grace is sufficient. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. We need more grace. And the Bible tells us how to get more grace. How? Humble yourself. God, I need you. God, I can't do this without you. I can do nothing of myself, Lord. You are the, you are the strength of my life. In you I live and move and have all my being, Father. No flesh will glory in your presence, Father. I can't do this without you. And we let him know how much we need him. And he gives us grace for the battle. He gives us strength to be able to go forward. And when we humble ourselves, the Bible says there should be a, re a result of us humbling ourselves, and that is casting all your care upon the Lord. Yes. To the extent that we humble ourselves, it's to the same extent that we cast our care upon the Lord. What are some cares? What are some anxieties? What are some worries? Money? Okay, let's write that down. Anything else? Kids? Woo! Okay, he's keeping it real. We're in church. Anybody else? Health? Oh, yeah, health is a big one. Jobs. People need jobs. Anything? What? Relationships. Somebody said wife, and I'm putting an asterisk next to that. <laughs> I hope she's not sitting next to you, my brother. <laughs> Anybody else? What else? What else burdens us? What else do we worry? What else do we worry about? What? Unsaved. Unsaved. Unsaved family members. Yes, of course. Status. status. Woohoo! We care about status, huh? Do you know? Do you know when it says? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you. You know, part of the word exalt means to dignify, which means that when we don't feel we're dignified, we strive to be dignified. But if we humble ourselves under God's hand, he will dignify us. Wow. Status. Okay, so we have all this stuff. Now, when my wife, when, when we were uh, parents of our younger children, we're still parents of our children, but when our kids were younger, we did a little devotional thing with them. Scott, can you come on up here, my friend? Let's give it up for Scott. Come on, Scott, you the man. Give me a high five, baby. Okay, take this can. Now, this, these are my hands right here. And we did this with our kids because we were trying to show them this principle of casting your cares over on God. So we put our cares on a piece of paper. And then we said, here's a trash can. These are God's hands. Now, these are your cares. These are your worries. These are your concerns. These are things that are keeping you up. These are things that are making you cry at night. Take those cares and just throw them over to God. I was hoping you were going to say, I was like, please make sense. Thank you, Scott. Cast the care over on the Lord. Cast all your cares upon the Lord. Cast all your cares upon the For he cares for you, and he knows what 
that you're going through. So why don't you cast all your cares upon the Lord? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've got to cast our cares upon the Lord. Third thing we learn from Peter, be sober and be watchful. Be sober and be watchful. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. It's telling us to be sober. All of us have maybe seen someone who's intoxicated. Maybe we've been intoxicated before. And we know that in that state, you're not self-controlled. You say things that you probably wouldn't say if you weren't intoxicated. You do things you probably you, you wouldn't do if you were not intoxicated. Peter is saying here, we need to be sober. And in context, we need to be sober, which means we need to be free from the influence of pride. We need to be free from the influence of self-ambition. And may God help us be free from the weights of whatever it is we're going through so our mind can be clear. So if our mind is clear, then we can control our words, our speech, to where we're not using it to gain an advantage or actually offend someone, which is literally what the word means, sober. And so, therefore, he says you got to be sober, but you got to be watchful. I'm always impressed and just moved whenever I hear military personnel tell me how they have to stay up late to keep watch while others sleep just in case someone tries to attack. You got to stay up and you got to watch. You got to watch. Why? Because we do have an adversary. And sometimes he's coming, and sometimes we, we may not uh, uh, be aware of him. Sometimes things happen, and we just, cons we just log it in as natural. It's just natural. And in, in a lot of cases, yes, it is just natural. But then there are other cases, dear friend, where something is beyond just the natural. There is a, a spiritual element. There is a force that is coming from the evil one. Do you guys remember when Jesus said, guys, who do men say that I, the son of men, am? Well, some say, you know, you're, you're Jeremiah. Some say Elijah. Some say you're one of the prophets. He said, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And then Jesus goes on and says, you know, I have to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to suffer. The Son of Man is going to be crucified. He's going to be killed. And then Peter says, no, not so, Lord. You're not going to be killed. Jesus then turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. It sounds to me like Peter was just trying to be a good friend. I don't want you to die. You're not going to die. Jesus said, no, that what you just said to me was not from my father. That was from the evil one. Satan, you used him to try to get me to not do what I've been called and sent to do. Why? Jesus was sober. Why? He was watching. And he realized everything that was going around that was being said to him. And he realized when the enemy was coming at him and when the enemy wasn't. And Peter is saying, guys, I want you to be sober. I want you to be watchful. And then he says, I want you to resist the devil. Stand against him. That's what Jesus did in that scenario. He stood against that word that was trying to get him to do opposite. Whenever we understand what God's word says to us, and then we act in accordance with it, we're okay. But whenever someone tries to pull us out of what the scripture says, to us that we clearly understand, friend, we need to oppose that. And oftentimes it comes by way of thought. The devil gives us thoughts that are contrary and opposing themselves to the word of God. Now, how do you resist the devil? I'm so glad that you asked today. <laughs> One way is to pray in the name of Jesus. 
and use the authority in that name against him. I once read a great old time saint of God said we need to pray a violent prayer at least once a day. Because the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Then we need to praise. Praise is part of our weaponry as a Christian. It silences the enemy and the avenger according to Psalm 8. You want to burst the devil's eardrums? Start to praise God. Start to bless the Lord. Start to glorify God. Start to magnify God. Start to sing hallelujah, even though you might not feel like it. And then we need to proclaim. Proclaim what God's word says. Speak the word. When the devil came to Jesus, he said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become bread. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He gave an answer to the enemy who gave him a thought of what he should do or not do. And I want to tell you today, sometimes, dear friend, we're getting a barrage of thoughts that are coming to our mind. You're going to die. You're going to be sick. You're always going to be poor and broke. You're never going to get married. Nobody likes you. God doesn't care about you. We're getting a barrage of thoughts and nobody else knows what's coming in our mind except us. We've got to do something about those thoughts. You've got to resist them or else they will get planted in your thinking. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Speak. That's the one thing that we as God's creative beings have the ability to do. Animals cannot speak. Birds can't speak. Dogs can bark, but they can't speak. But we've been created in God's image and likeness, and we are to speak forth the word of God. The last and final thing that we're going to learn from Peter is we need to be assured. We need to be assured and I would love it if the keyboard player can come on out right now. 1 Peter 5 and 10. It says, but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while. Everybody say suffered a while. while. Perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Be assured of two things, beloved. Your suffering is just for a while. Now, let me explain. There's a couple of ways to look at this. A while and compared to eternity. That's definitely applicable and apropos. And then a while in that after you've been suffering, there comes a point in time where You start to get stronger. You start to get settled in. And that that unsettledness, that shakiness that you experienced before is no longer there. You just, you're in a, a more solid place and just anchoring your heart and your hope and your faith and trust in God. But then there's another consideration I want to submit to you for your consideration and perhaps your even further study. When it says your suffering is for a while, that just maybe perhaps there is an end date to some of our suffering. That does not mean we'll never suffer, we'll never go through stuff again. I'm not suggesting that. But I'm suggesting and submitting this, that sometimes there is a season where things are more challenging and more difficult than they've ever been. And that season may not last always. In 1 Kings 5 and 4, it says, But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. 1 Kings 8, 56, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise which he promised through his servant Moses. The Bible says that we live our lives in seasons to Everything, there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. And I'm not saying to you that everything just goes away magically. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying there are seasons in God and in the kingdom when the blessing of God, the power of God, the goodness of God, and the anointing of God, they just seem to be so 
much more prevalent to us. And there are seasons when we're going through very hard, challenging, crying, difficult times. What I'm saying to you is that season doesn't have to go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. It can be for a while. And God can bring you deliverance. And God can bring you freedom and give you rest. And you say, well, what if my circumstances don't change? See, God can give you rest in here. That's why Paul said in Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can live my life not based on my circumstances, but I can live my life based on the strength that Christ provides for me. And just as God gave his people rest all around in the Old Testament and we're under a new covenant with better promises, I believe there is a rest of the, for the people of God that even though we've been going through some challenging times and some hard times, the Lord wants to give us a rest to where at least this thing has an end date and it's over. Weeping does endure for a night. But friend, I've got to also believe the other part of that verse. The joy comes in the morning. If I believe that I'm only supposed to weep and that all my days are going to look like or night, then I will lose heart. But if I believe that weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning, then I say like David in Psalm 27, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, not in heaven, in the land of the living. Be assured his grace is making you complete. He's working. He's working. The master is working. The potter is on the wheel and he's turning his artwork and he's removing the clumps and he's making you smoother. He's making you gentler. He's making you softer. He's making you more like him. You're starting to see people with new eyes, your heart is tender once again. You're broken over stuff like you once used to be because the potter is working his grace in you and is strengthening you, is settling you, is equipping you.